We bow our heads at this time. Gracious Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to once again teach your eternal word that is forever settled in heaven. We ask that you send help from your sanctuary and from on high. Bind the powers of darkness and the demons of hell. Beat back the hand of the wicked one. Give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Yes. Remember, Suffolk and Bishop Julian on vacation with Sister Julian. Give them traveling mercies in these times of inclement meteorological conditions where weather conditions are challenging the travels of the multitudes and where your wrath and anger is being released upon this country because of its rejection of truth and its, Lord God, immoral practices. But we ask that you would stretch out your hand of covering as you did Israel and Egypt and protect your people. Look after us, O oh God. Take us to and from our destinations. Preserve us in our walk with thee. Strengthen right now Pastor Doran Richardson and his precious wife, the First Lady of this church, the official board, the deacon board trustees, the willing workers, all that are part of the constitution of this great institution. Allow the word to continue to emanate from this place as a beacon of light and hope. Draw men and women, boys and girls, with bands and cords of love through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Trouble the waters in the baptism pool. That souls come and go down in your name and be filled with thy spirit. Taken on to perfection by holy hope, by holy and eternal word. And we'll praise and magnify, yes. glorify your holy name both now and henceforth and forevermore. In Jesus' name, put your hands together and say amen. So, Lord, God. Bless you. I apologize for uh, the lack of a tie. I was telling Pastor Dorian that at the Christ Temple of Indianapolis, Indiana, which I've had the privilege of preaching at for on many occasions, years ago, they did not wear a tie. Um, the senators, when they were on Senate Street, did not wear ties at all. They just buttoned their shirts to the top. So I guess I'm returning that tradition. Can we say amen? amen. <laughs> Being a bit facetious, but I do apologize if um, I'm offending anyone with the absence of a tie. I thought it would be easier for me to teach tonight without having to unbutton my top button. Can we say amen? amen. Now, we want to get quickly into the lesson uh, before we do get into the lesson, I would uh, suggest to those who are here tonight that uh, and reiterate some of the teachings and methods of teachings of the late Bishop Samuel Grimes, who served as the presiding bishop of the Pentecostal Assembly of the World from 1932 until his death in 1967. Uh, bishop. Ross Perry Paddock was his assistant for approximately 14 years of the 35 years that he served as our presiding bishop. And of course, um, he used to say, you interpret a text by its context, uh, which means that if you take a scripture out of its setting, you in fact will destroy its meaning. And so I'm simply making these statements to those of you that may consider yourself students of the Bible so that you will be mindful that we should be dealing with all scriptural subject matter and topics according to the text and within their proper context. Now for the tape and for those who are listening tonight taking notes, uh, in biblical hermeneutics there is a process of rightly dividing the scripture known as the context principle. And so Bishop Grimes, uh, being a, a student of hermeneutics and a hermeneutician, if there's such a term, uh, he certainly was accurate in his recommendation. In dealing with any subject matter, we must deal with subjects, topics in the Bible in their context when we're dealing with scriptures pertaining to the topic and or subject. And so I did want to mention there is the context principle of right division of the word of God. If we're going to rightly divide the scriptures, we must deal with the scriptures in their proper context. And then there is something the late Bishop Ross Perry Paddock used to um, mention and that is 
that God uses a very simple means to call our attention to scriptures that are more important than others, and that is called repetition, such as when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, um, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Therein we find repetition. There is another scripture in the Old Testament, I believe it is in the 20th chapter of the book of Isaiah, where it says the word was unto them line upon line, precept upon precept, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And so therefore, again, there's repetition found in the scriptures, and that follows something in hermeneutics known as the repetition principle. There is a pr principle used in biblical hermeneutics, and the term her hermeneutics uh, pertains to biblical theology known as the repetition principle. And that is consistent with the way in which the scriptures are rightly divided. There also is called a gap principle, and I will stop there because there's so many of them, we don't have time to deal with all of them tonight. There is the gap principle, and that particular principle has to do with a period of time in the scripture where there is a gap. If you have been taught on the 70 weeks of Daniel, you know that there are 69 weeks after Daniel fasted, 21 days, excuse me, and ask God what would happen to his people Israel. Um, God, God, of course, sent a Gabriel with the message immediately upon his request for that revelation. Obviously, the scripture is clear that Daniel went on a 21-day fast, uh, waiting for the answer because it took 21 days, and as much as Satan interfered or hindered Gabriel from bringing the message, and so the scripture says that Michael had to fight to uh, push Satan back, if you will, so that Gabriel could get the message to Daniel. When Daniel received the message, he received revelation of 69 weeks pertaining to Israel being in captivity until Jesus dying on Calvary. And then he did not see the 2,000 year church dispensation. And then, of course, he saw the 70th week which has to do with the seven-year tribulation period that will follow the rapture of the church. That is something known as the gap principle. And so that's just one illustration. Can the church say amen? amen. So simply sharing these things with you in my preliminary remarks to help you with regard to these things found in the scripture. Now then also, um, uh, one of our sisters asked a question uh, regarding the, um, if you will, the um, giving of the bill of divorcement and putting Israel away. I will go back to that just to answer that question again in greater detail as I call your attention to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah 3, if you have your Bibles. And then we will get into the lesson. But if you have Jeremiah chapter 3 and verses number 6 through verse number 8, can the church say amen? As is our custom tonight, I'm going to ask as I call my first scripture, that all of us will read these scriptures out loud together. I'm going to ask you to participate, all to get involved. If you will get involved, then no one will fall asleep. Because this train carries, someone say, no sleepers. I want you to get involved. We want you to participate. If you will read with us, then the word of God will make an impression upon you that it cannot make if you just sit looking off into space uh, while someone else reads it in your hearing. And then in Romans chapter 10, I believe it is, verse number 17, the word of God says there, uh, Paul wrote the word of God is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. And this is where we want it tonight, in your mouths, in all of our mouths, and in all of our hearts. Now this is 
to prove that God is not married to the backslider. He was married to that backslider. But he gave that backslider, Israel, the bill of divorcement and put her away. And this then freed her up. Uh, Judah was the only one she continued her relationship with until Jesus came in the flesh and the Jews as a nationality rejected him and he died on Calvary. When they rejected him as the Messiah and he died on Calvary, that freed him from his relationship with Judah. Uh, when he gave Israel this bill of divorcement, that freed God from his relationship with Israel. As I mentioned to you on last night, they were a divided kingdom after the days of 40 years of reign under Solomon. This is how it was. So let's pick it up in the third chapter of Jeremiah in verses number 6 through 8. If you have it, let's begin reading. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Has thou seen that which backsliding Israel have done? She is gone up upon every howl mountain and upon every green tree, and there have played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now this then should be clear. He severed his relationship with Israel because she refused all of his overtures for reconciliation. And this is what he is saying in verse number 8. When he says, and when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, he tried everything he could to persuade her to cease and desist, if I can use that terminology since I'm still an active member of law enforcement, um, to cease and desist from uh, all of her spiritual adultery and idolatry. And this was something she refused to do. And so then uh, he gave her, as it states here, a bill of divorce, put her away, and now he was free from Israel. Now then your Bible says in the New Testament, let's go to the 19th chapter of the book of St. John. Your Bible says he came into his own, but his own received him not. Now of those that are spoken of, we're going to St. John chapter 19. That's not, we're not going, going to the scripture I just quoted. But of those that received him, a remnant did receive him, and he, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. So let me show you just a few scriptures, since I can't deal with that in its totality tonight. In the 19th chapter of the book of um, St. John, uh, this came to us years ago by the late Bishop Carl F. Smith in teaching a Bible class. Uh, for those of you that have his teachings, he was making this profound observation. Jesus is now on the cross. He is hanging on Calvary. And um, as he is has, has being crucified here, um, there are two Marys present at his crucifixion. And one of them is his mother. Can we say amen? Another one, I should say, um, <clears throat> well, I should say three Marys, because there's, in verse number 25, there's Mary, um, the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene, and then Mary, the mother of Jesus. So there are three Marys present here. And so let us pick it up in the 19th chapter and verse number uh, 23, let's read. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier, a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, 
and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. They did not realize they were fulfilling scriptures to their own condemnation. But as we indicated on last night, the scriptures must be fulfilled by someone. The good in the scriptures will be fulfilled by the good and the righteous, and the wicked in the scriptures shall be fulfilled by the, the wicked. There must be wicked, and there must be good. There must be righteous, and there must be unrighteous. There must be godly, and there must be ungodly. Someone must and will go to heaven, and most certainly multitudes will go where? Someone say to hell. You're not cursing. Turn to someone and say, that's not a curse word. That's a Bible word. <laughs> multitudes shall go where? They're going to go to hell. Um, Sheol, however you want to call it, uh, is the grave. But uh, we're talking about Gehenna, the lake that burneth with what? Fire and brimstone. So this is an absolute must because the scriptures must come to pass. The soldiers here were fulfilling the scriptures and casting lots for his garments. Now let's pick it up in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, that's one Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, that's two Marys, read. And Mary Magdalene, that's three Marys. All right, verse 26. When Jesus saw, the, the, when, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, that would be John, read. He saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Now please underline that. This was Jesus officially severing all earthly natural ties with his mother. No longer can Mary be referred to as the mother of Jesus because he just said, woman, behold thy son. We're getting ready to show you the other scripture in just a moment. And this is where he severed all his earthly and fleshly ties so no one can make fleshly claims to Jesus Christ. There is a New Testament scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul said, Though we have known him after the flesh, henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. And as he severed his relationship with his mother Mary, an all biological relationship with respect to his earthly ties to the natural, he severed it with Judah. And this, this is because of his death on Calvary. Everything with him now is spiritual. Nothing with him is natural. And we'll just clear, uh, clear that up with our final scripture as we go fur, uh, further in this and then go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. All right? So, woman, behold thy son, verse 27. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own house. And this should be clear then that uh, even though the Catholic Church celebrates Jesus as uh, Mary as the mother of Jesus, this is in gross error. They do not have this revelation. They do not have this understanding. They, they do not realize they are in direct violation of the scriptures, i.e. the word of God. Now let me give you a final scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, if you will. And most of this you know, I'm just bringing this back to your remembrance. Can we say amen? Then <laughs> we'll get into our subject on tonight. All right. Um, <clears throat> and we'll begin with verse number 14. And we will read down through verse number 16. Let us begin reading. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. That would mean all Jews and all Gentiles and Samaritans, if you want to use the three races in the human family. Jews and Gentiles in general are the two races. You want to include mixed Jews, it would be Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles, spoken of as far as the scriptures are concerned. We're not talking about what the world said. We're talking about what the Bible says. Can we say amen? All right, let us read on. Uh-huh. That he died for all, they which live should not henceforth live 
unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So that's clear when uh, we come to Christ now that he died for all. Uh, we are not supposed to, from the time we come into Christ through the new birth experience of being born again of water and spirits, live unto ourselves. Now, this is what some people continue to do, even leaders seem to think that it's all about them, about who they are. They want to be recognized. They want, as one bishop said, he wanted his legacy. I don't know how he could think that that would have anything to do with spirituality, but he wanted his legacy to be his celebrity ship. This is because he was deceived, and he is deceived. But the fact of the matter is, we're not supposed to live any longer unto who? Someone say ourselves. But unto him which died for them and rose again. All right, verse number 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now... Henceforth know we him no more. And you know the next scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So this, in answer to a sister's question, this is how it was. He had to be freed to take a Gentile bride. And the way he was freed to lawfully, according to his law, take a Gentile bride is that Israel would not cease and desist from committing adultery and idolatry. So he gave her a bill of divorcement and put her away. Judah died in unbelief. They didn't believe. <laughs> and so that was their death. And Jesus died on Calvary. But after he died on Calvary, he died on Calvary so they would believe. And what did they do? They did not believe. And so his death severed his relationship with them and ended it. And the only way they can get back in now is through the gospel of who? Now we understand they have been cut off according to the 11th chapter, I believe it is the book of Romans. We understand that now that they have been cut off as, as branches, natural branches, and we have been grafted in. But the only thing that qualifies us to be grafted in is our faith. If we cease to believe, Paul said, we'll be cut off also. That's in that same chapter. And so the only reason that we're in is because of faith in the gospel of who? Jesus Christ. So as long as we understand that, I don't know if this helped, uh, sister, you asked that question last night. Hopefully this enlightens and enriches and brings to your attention in greater detail uh, what God hath wrought. Can the church say amen? amen. Now tonight uh, we're going to get into the calling of the pastor. We have to get into that. We're going to call your attention tonight to the book of Acts of the Apostles, and we're going to condense this subject as well, but we are going to deal in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts with the calling of the pastor. You have a young pastor. He has uh, served under self Bishop Julian uh, for a number of years. You have elected him to the office of pastor. It would be of benefit both to this congregation and to him as well to understand how this has worked and how it has always worked as far as God's word is concerned, the calling of the pastor. Now, <laughs> um, there was at, um, the late Elder Tobin who used to pastor this church when it was on Reno Street many years ago. He was teaching a Bible class, and he, this is a story he told. He said this actually happened. He said a young man came to him many years ago and said he, was felt, he felt he was called to preach. He asked the young man, well, how do you feel and why do you feel that you're called to preach? This was the answer of the young man. He said, I was sitting outside and I heard a bird going, preach, 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 preach. That's a true story. <laughs> And Dishagata Tobin had to let him know that is not the call of God. That's the call of the wild. Can we say hallelujah? <laughs> That's about what that amounts to. But that is a true story. This is exactly how it was. And unfortunately, it seems that many individuals who are trying to occupy the pulpit have not been called. And certainly if they have been called, they have not been prepared and sent properly. 
And this is why people spiritually are in the condition in so-called Christianity that they're in today. Because there are so many hirelings and there are so many false prophets and so many individuals that claim to be pastors but they are not called and have not been prepared nor have they ever been sent to do the job that God has called apostolic pastors to do. Now that said, uh, here is a um, New Testament example of Moses. He is the pastor in the Bible of the largest church on record in the history of mankind. That is the children of Israel. That particular church numbered somewhere between two and a half and four million people. I'm sure you've heard this before. We don't know the exact numbers. There is no scripture that gives us the exact numbers. Uh, all we know is the Bible says there were 600,000 footmen besides the women and the children. And given that number, then Bible students and Bible scholars, theologians have estimated that there was somewhere between two and a half on the low end and four million on the high end, people that came out of Egypt under the auspices of Moses. So it would be a benefit to us to just read it for ourselves, even though it's going to be a bit lengthy in reading. And we will begin in verse number 20 through 37, so I don't have to try to rehearse it when all we have to do is read it. Can the church say amen? amen. So let's begin with the call of Moses to the office of the pastor. Pastor, again, of what is referred to as the church in the wilderness, the largest church on record in the history of mankind. All right, verse number 20 through 37 is what we're interested in. Let's read. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. Now, you will see in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews as we go there after reading this, nourished up in his father's house three months means in the house of Pharaoh. Because historically, you may remember, uh, he in fact, um, well, excuse me let, me, let me, let me correct this. He in fact was taken after being born into Pharaoh's house. Can the church say amen? And being taken after he was born into Pharaoh's house, that's because he was drawn out of the water. His name means, Moses means drawn out of the waters. Can we say amen? Let's read on verse 21. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. This is after he was born in Jewry among the Hebrews. He was three months old. And of course, Pharaoh issued an edict to kill all of the born, the babies. And so they didn't follow the instruction. Uh, some of them didn't, didn't, should I say. And Moses was taken, put in the water to save his life, and was drawn out of those waters by Pharaoh's daughter. And then it was that from the time he was in Pharaoh's house, he was being raised as one of Pharaoh's sons. All right. Verse number 22 read. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, this simply means that because he was in Pharaoh's house, he was subject to the best education, the best exposure and training that was available in the then known world in that day in as much as he being a member of Pharaoh's house was being trained to succeed Pharaoh at the throne of the emperorship of Egypt. And so that means that he was in line of succession. Now, illustration would be many years ago, you may remember, uh, when Prince Charles was being raised, and he still is being raised, uh, as a prince to one day be the king of England. And he married um, Diana. Of course, that didn't last. And then she got involved, as you're well aware, with a Muslim. And because the family wasn't going to have that, uh, somehow she wound up in a car accident. Can we say amen? Uh, they weren't about to have a Muslim in line to be in a position of authority in that kingdom. Nevertheless, uh, Charles continues now. 
He's, Diana's passed away. He's got a new wife. But he's being groomed to be the king one day. And, of course, the Queen of England, I think she's still alive, isn't she, Elizabeth? Yeah, she looks like she's going to live to be a thousand years old. Not quite, but I'm just exaggerating. But she's yet alive. But, but those, uh, he in particular, is being trained at the best educational institutions in the world. He is subject to the best um, exposure of all things. And one day, uh, he will, if he lives, he'll sit on the throne as the king in that country. The king, I would imagine, is called Great Britain. That said, I'm simply giving you that as an illustration of Moses. Moses was in line in Pharaoh's household to, in fact, succeed Pharaoh. That means he would have been, in fact, in line to become the leader of the entire world as the successor of Pharaoh when that time would come. But you'll see then, as we read on here and read in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, he made a choice. And it was because of the influence of God in his life and on him that led him to make a choice when he was called to pastor the children of Israel. So now let's pick it up now in verse number 36. Read. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let's verse number 23. Let's read. Uh huh. And when. He was 40 years old. Now, this is Moses. Moses is how old now? 40 years old. Read. He came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now, th this is why we're giving you this verse. This is generally how God calls any person to the ministry. It comes into their heart. Now, there's, it's true. There are other illustrations. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 through 21, uh, Samuel was called at the age of six years old. Uh, God called him uh, three times, it, and he did not recognize the voice of God. And so um, when he came to Eli, Eli kept telling him to go and lie back down. After the third time, Eli recognized it was God speaking to Samuel, and he said, the next time that you hear the voice, simply say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And so um, Samuel did that, and God began to speak to Samuel and give him revelation concerning his calling and what would happen to Eli and his sons. Because Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were laying with the women in the church in the very door of the tabernacle and committing fornication. So this is how it was back with Samuel. Samuel was called at the age of six but he did not embark upon his calling until 24 years later. He served under Eli because his mother, I believe it is his mother's name is Hannah, she asked for him in prayer. God opened her womb and gave uh, her Samuel in prayer, and she agreed by oath and covenant that if God gave her a man-child, she would give him back to God. And this is what she did. And so he, of course, uh, was called at six, and then he served for 24 years under Eli until he embarked upon his ministry at the age of 30 years of age. Can the church say amen? So he was called in a way that he heard the voice of God as audible as you hear me speaking on tonight. Moses was called in this way. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now he was in uh, the palaces of Pharaoh. He was living among the most powerful, wealthy, educated, advantaged individuals on the face of the earth. But somehow, God was dealing with his heart to go down among the children of Israel who at that time were slaves. So in order for him to go down and visit them, he would have to actually condescend, leave Pharaoh's palace, and go down and be among the slaves who had been enslaved by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Can the church say amen? amen? So please underline, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. This was the call of God in the life of Moses. Now he was not ready. He was not prepared. He was just called. This is his calling. And just because someone is called does not mean that they're ready to go. 
as Bishop Paddock used to say, calling means come here, not go there. Can the church say amen? <laughs> and this is what some people get confused. They get the calling confused with the sending. Can the church say amen? And so now he is 40 years old when he's called. Please make a note of that in verse number 23. And when he was full 40 years old, he has been in Pharaoh's house for how long? 40 years. He's been living among the wealthy for how long? 40 years. He has been living sumptuously for how long? 40 years. He's been living the life with the rich and famous for how long? 40 years. I mean, just the way it is. And then now God is called him dealing with his heart. Verse number 24, read. And seeing one of them suffer wrong. That's one of the Hebrew uh, Israelites, his brothers and sisters, uh, or brother it would be, suffer wrong. Read. He defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Uh-huh. For he supposed his brother would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now, why did not they understand? Because he was called. He was not sent. And so it was not time for him to go and do anything. It was simply time for him to answer the call of God so that he could be prepared to do something later. And we'll see that as we go along. He was mistaken. His actions were premature. He acted presumptuously. He acted unwisely. He acted on his own as opposed to being led by God. And so this was because he was too young, too early in his calling, and unprepared. And obviously, they didn't recognize him uh, as being anyone that God had sent because he had not been sent. He just had been, please say it out loud, called. called. Can the church say amen? amen. So he's, he may have supposed, but he supposed wrongfully. He made the wrong assumption. Verse 26, and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. This is a strove means they're contending, they're striving against each other. Read, and would have set them at one again saying, sirs, your brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? Verse 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? 28. Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? And so they did not recognize him because he was not prepared. He had only been called. He had not been sent. So what did Moses do? Verse 29, then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. Verse 30, and when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness in Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire in a bush. This was the Lord in a theophanies. The Lord in angel form. He appeared unto him in the bush. This is 40 years later. Now he is 80 years old. When he was called, he was how old? He was 40. But now 40 years later, he's been trained how to survive on the backside of the desert, working under his father-in-law Jethro. And, of course, he's married an Egyptian woman or uh, uh, at least a black woman. I think she was Egyptian. I'm just guessing here. But he married a woman uh, who was a dif different ethnicity. And now he is uh, prepared because he has trained for 40 years how to survive in the desert. But this is the area that God is going to carry him through uh, when, in fact, he leads him down to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let Israel go. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Let Israel go. And so now, at 40 years have expired, um, he is uh, seeing God in this flame of fire, this bush. One scripture said, our God is a con consuming fire. Can we say amen? amen. Now, verse 20, 31 read, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord 
came unto him, verse 32, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. He, he turned away, turned his face away because he revered God, of his reverence for God. All right, verse 33. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into where? Please underline that. Now come, I will send thee. Now it's time to go. When, when, be, when he was called, it came into his heart. And then God made preparation for him to be prepared by allowing the circumstances to cause him to leave and go into the desert so that he could be trained. I'm sure you know if you read uh, the book of Exodus that he was trained under the auspices of his father, I believe it is Jethro. So uh, be that as it may, I will send thee into Egypt. This is the sending of Moses, the pastor of what is referred to in this particular chapter as the church in the wilderness. All right, read on now, verse 35. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? Now that's what they did when it first came where? Into his heart, when he was only 40 years old. But 40 years later, after 40 years of preparation, now God is with him. All right? This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? Read, The same did God sin to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So this was Moses sending. But it took 40 years of what? Preparation. You should understand, pastors, if they're going to be successful, they must go through a period of what? Preparation. Everyone must go through a period of preparation. Everything that is done with respect to God in the Bible went through a period of preparation. Before the Sabbath, there always was the day of preparation. So it is nonsense for people to think, that they're going to do something when they have not been properly prepared. All right, verse 36. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Uh-huh. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet to the Lord your God, Raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Now that is a prophecy of who? Someone say Jesus Christ. If you're keeping notes, verse 37 is a prophecy by Moses as he is under the influence of the Holy Spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's finish verse 38, read. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. That's, and this is speaking of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not only in the fleshly body when he came in the flesh and worked in that body for 33 and a half years, but Jesus Christ was also in the church in the wilderness. The rock that followed them was called Christ, but Jesus Christ was not there in the flesh. He was there in the spirit. Someone say in the spirits. So we don't get um, discouraged just because of the foolishness that is going on in the world today. Foolish, turn someone and say, foolishness has always been going on in the world. It's just more prevalent and in your face today than it's been in many generations in times past. So do not be weary in well-doing. Smile. Turn to someone and say, smile. Turn to your name and say, if you're happy, please notify your face. Please cheer up around here. It's going to be all right. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Verse 38 again, read. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai 
and with our fathers who receive the lively oracles to give unto us. Now, uh, this verse 38 is speaking of the Old Testament church, the lively oracles of the Ten Commandments and the 613 ordinances. 248 said thou shalt, 365 said thou shalt not. Those are those ordinances that were nailed to the cross when Jesus went to Calvary's cross. In those ordinances were contained six sacrifices, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the trespass offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, and the offering of consecration. These six offerings are found in Leviticus chapter 1 through Leviticus chapter 8. All of those offerings were nailed to the cross when Jesus died on Calvary. The Bible says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances in the book of Colossians that were against us, taking them out of the way, nailing them to the cross, and taking them out of the way. So Jesus came and fulfilled those ordinances. Now there is no need for those sacrifices because Jesus gave himself, brothers and sisters, once for all. He offered himself once for all. Why once? Because he was not a sinner. The high priest had to go in on the Day of Atonement at least twice because he had to go in once for himself and the underpriest, and then he had to go back in on the same day for the people. So it was one day, at least twice in one day. But because Jesus was not a sinner, he offered himself once for all. And that in and of itself is another Bible class that would probably take four to six hours to teach. Can we say hallelujah? All right, so now um, let's um, uh, finish up verse, down to verse 40. Uh, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. Now that simply means, just as it was in that day, there's no such thing as unconditional what? Eternal security. There's a kind of eternal security, but it is conditional. And it is based on the foreknowledge of God. It simply means that God knows all of those who will make it. But we don't know. And the book that he has written, known as the Lamb's Book of Life, was finished before the foundation of the world. This is what the scripture says. So he completed that book before the foundation of the world. He knows all the names of those who are in that book because he knows the end from the beginning. He declared the end from the beginning and called the things that are, though, are not as though they were, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So this simply is a type. You see, in the Bible, there's types, there's shadows, there's patterns, there's fashions, there's figures, there's examples, there's manners, there's prophecy, and there's prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, and then there are forms. These are 10 words in the Bible that refer to things in the Old Testament that were typified that Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament. And we don't have time to deal with that, but we're simply making you aware these are things that are in the scriptures. And so this then was an example that we're reading about here in the seventh chapter of the book of the, book, of, the, of the Acts of the Apostles. And they were typical or a type of the church today. As many of them turned back and wanted to go back in Egypt in that day, many people have come to our churches and backslidden or fallen away and gone back into the world which Egypt was a type of. And uh, it, can we renew them again to repentance? The sixth chapter of Hebrews said we can't renew them again. Now God can bring them back, but you can't bring them back. I just got a phone call today. I tried to tell her mother, the young lady, um, <laughs> I tried to explain to her well, when she was in the church, she was running around. I said, called her up. God told me to call her up. And I explained to her, um, that young lady in front of everyone, that one day something very t tragic is going to happen to you. I said, because you come in here and disrespect the house of God in front of all these people. Well, she wouldn't listen. She went out, disrespected her mother. The scripture says, honor thy mother and thy father, or father and mother, that their days may be long upon the land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. So she went out there and got into mischief. A relative of hers 
took a weapon out of my house. And she took it and sold it in the streets. I asked her to bring the weapon back, myself and some of the deputies. She wouldn't return it. She got arrested on some other charges. Then she had an episode with some sort of substance abuse, went into a coma. Pastor Steve Skiba from our church went up and prayed for her. And, of course, um, God brought her out of the coma just last week. But today she was killed in a car accident. She ran into a tree and killed instantly. Well, so this is the way it is. Now, if she had listened, she could be alive. Another young man in our church, whom your pastor knows, uh, he was involved in some very assorted things. He uh, abused a number of people in our church. Myself and Bishop Herman testified against him. He went to prison, tried to blame it all on me. Then he got out of prison after three years and went after the parole officer's daughter and went back to prison. It shows you how silly and corrupt he was. And then he was killed just a few months ago. A truck ran over him on 496 over in Lansing, Michigan. So many people leave our churches and go back where? Into Egypt. And when they get out there, the enemy is going to do everything he can to kill them. Because the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy them. Steal what? Steal salvation. Kill your body and destroy your soul in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. And I've seen it in my 35 years of pastor over and over again. I've tried to explain this to individuals. Uh, and then the funny thing is, after it happens, they get mad at me. I tell them, I don't, don't get mad at me. I'm not God. I was sitting here to warn you, to help you. And if you listen, you can live. And if you don't listen, then you have to accept the consequences that go along with being recalcitrant, rebellious, disrespectful. Can the church say amen? amen. And so now uh, it says to whom the fathers would not obey. Some people turn to someone and say some people will not obey. Well, the Bible says obey them, they have the what? So some people will not obey. They will not listen. As they did in that day, it is human nature. The human condition, what we've inherited from Adam, is a fallen nature. And if you're going to walk after human nature, you will not obey. If I'm going to walk after human nature, I won't obey. Because the Bible said, in the flesh is no good thing. So the flesh, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. It's impossible. So they would not obey. Obviously, back in those days, they didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, they had a struggle with their faith also. They would not obey, the scripture says but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. This is what they did with their pastor in that day, verse 40, saying unto Aaron, make unto us, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Well, this is when they made the golden calf, because he was up in Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments and the 613 ordinances. And they didn't want to um, wait for the 40 days that he was up there. So they wanted to do things their way, much like the attitude of young people today. Can the church say amen? amen? So this then is the call of Moses. Now let's go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. As we continue with this, keep in mind also, there was the call of Elijah. If you remember Elijah's call in 1 Kings Chapter 19, verses 18 to 21 in your spare time. Elijah was plowing in the field. And Eli, uh, Elisha was plowing in the field. Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle over. And the influence of God from Elisha was so great on Elisha that he dropped the plow and took off running behind Elijah. Now he simply said, can I go back? And put some things in order in my house. And Elijah said, what have I to do with you? He said, I have some things I have to take care of. You read it in your spare time. So he went and set some things in order, made a sacrifice. That's Elisha. He came back and he followed Elijah. And the Bible says in 2 Kings 3, chapter 3, verse number 11, Elisha poured, hand, poured, poured water on the hands of Elisha for 12 years. That means he served him for 12 years before Eli Chubb was caught up in a whirlwind and gave him his request that he receive a double portion of the anointing that was upon him. 
that a double portion meant he had twice the responsibility, he had to do twice the amount of work, and if you read and compare the miracles of Elijah with the miracles of Elijah, he did twice as many miracles. So it simply has to do with an increased amount of work for those who want to talk about the anointing. The anointing is about, turn to someone and say, the anointing is about working. And that's what many people don't want to do. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, as we go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we want verses 23 through verses number 29. If you have that, can you say amen? amen? All right. This should do what we need here to deal with the call of the pastor. Uh-huh. Read now. Uh, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his who? So he was in his parents' house. He was in the Hebrew home, and then they took him, and they put him in the river, and he was drawn out of the waters by Pharaoh's daughter. And then 40 years in Pharaoh's house where he was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. That meant um, he was being trained to succeed Pharaoh. That's what that means. All right? Enough of that. Uh, when he was uh, born, he was here three months of his parents. Read, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Well, the king's of commandment was to kill the child. Can we say amen? Read on. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, when he was come... Uh, when, he was, uh, when he was come to years, that means when he was 40 years of age. Because that's when it came into his heart to visit his brethren. And then he went from the palace down to the slaves and began to try to reconcile matters among his people. This is what this refers to. When he was come to years. This is when he was 40 years of age. It says here, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, what happened after that? Then the next day he tried to, after he killed an Egyptian, he tried to reconcile matters among his brethren. They said, and the one brother said, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian and bury me too? So then he took off, he left Pharaoh's palace and went into the wilderness. He was gone for 40 years. He was no longer being trained to take Pharaoh's place. He's now being trained in the desert to be a pastor. And so that's very uh, similar to many of us who leave our cause. When I was at Michigan State, I was um, uh, hired at American Bank and Trust before it became First of America, before it became that city, before it became PNC Bank. I was being uh, trained as a banker. I was going, eventually going to go into investment banking. That means I would have been Mitt Romney's twin brother. Can we say amen? I'm, I'm, being, I'm being a little facetious there. <laughs> uh, but I can assure you, um, if I had lived, I would have been um, an investment banker if the Lord had allowed me to live to do so. But I was called to the ministry. So uh, when Jim Dutmers and John Curry and um, uh, Clyde McKenzie and all those VPs called me in and I uh, wanted to talk about me becoming one of the vice presidents. I told them I couldn't do it. And they said, well, what are you talking about? You can't do it. I said, I'm called to pastor. And they said, what does that mean? And so we went out to lunch, and they kept putting pressure on me, and God told me to quit the job. Now, I certainly was not <laughs> slated to be the, the, the ruler of some free world, like, or ruler of the world like Moses was being ruled. But I did quit the job and took a job at Xerox Corporation and worked at Xerox Corporation um, for six years. It was a horrible job, even though it paid okay and had good benefits. And I was moving up the ranks in Xerox, and then I had to turn those opportunities down. One of the opportunities was to be uh, a sales representative in the Grand Rapids area, but I was pastoring over in Jackson. And so when Ray Moreland uh, and... Um, Jose de Costa, or Jose de Costa came down from Rochester, New York to meet with me to ask me if I wanted to take a sales position and move up the ranks into corporate America to be a corporate executive. I told him I couldn't do it. So now the second time around, I had to turn it down. So I turned 
both of those opportunities down to be a pastor. Uh, no doubt I would have been in the big money because Mitt Romney makes something like $300 million to $500 million a year. And no doubt would have been on Wall Street or I probably would have been dead because if God calls you and you turn down the calling, many times it'll cost you your life. Can we say amen? amen. <laughs> so I'm simply using that as an illustration that ultimately uh, I did have to turn down all of those overtures, all of those offers that came to me to be a successful businessman. Now, I never thought about it anymore. Once I turned it down, I kept on going. And God ultimately allowed me to be involved in, in building 11 building projects in Jackson, Michigan and building the largest seating capacity church in that city within the confines of the city. And then in addition to that, he allowed me to build a health care organization, to build the largest health care organization in terms of those contracting with the health care um, department there in Jackson of any kind in the city. As a matter of fact, the health care company I run has more employees than the city itself, almost twice as many employees, So, and is worth tens of millions of dollars. Now, that's just what God did as a result of me sacrificing and doing what he told me to do. And this is how it is. Pastors have to give up their careers. They have to give up their dreams, give up their vision, give up whatever it is that they want to do so that they can fulfill the call of God on their life. Moses had to give up these things to become the pastor of the church in the wilderness. This is what we're simply trying to say to you. Can we say amen? In addition to that, I never expected to be bishop over Michigan. I never wanted bishop over Michigan. This is why there was controversy, because I was trying to go to the Dominican Republic. I had actually cut a deal with Bishop uh, Moses Butler, gone there, found a place that I was going to purchase, we had decided how we were going to split the diocese um, uh, because I was able to fund it uh, and fund churches over there. I was ready to go. i have been preaching over there for years, donating tens of thousands of dollars to building churches in the Dominican Republic and in Venezuela and all parts of the island areas down in, in South America. And, of course, then the pressure came from so many people for me to take Michigan, uh, and it just kept coming, so I just decided to write a letter and ask for a transfer because I was the senior bishop and according to the law the senior bishop has first rights of refusal then um, when I requested it Bishop Bowers insisted that I uh, push to be transferred I told him I would I put the letter in and even though there was some slight controversy with it because the other bishop who put his name in did not realize he was violating the law to even do that but um, uh, that little slight controversy was settled by the Board of Bishops. They vote, voted uh, 34 to 16 for me to take Michigan. And here I am today. I never expected to be in this position. I didn't want anything from Michigan other than to serve. This is all I wanted to do is serve. For that is what we're all supposed to do. We're supposed to all want to do what? Serve. Can we say amen? All right. Someone say the call of God. Let's finish this up now. Uh, verse number 24. Let's read it again. If you have it, can you say amen? amen? Let's read. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Yes, he could have had anything he wanted in the world when he was in Pharaoh's house. He could have had as much of anything he wanted in the world when he was in Pharaoh's house because the Egyptian kingdom was one of the richest kingdoms in the history of civilization. But this is the way it was. He made a choice. He had a choice and he made it because it came into his house, his heart, excuse me, when he was in Pharaoh's house to leave there and to visit his brother. He made that choice and he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Can the church say amen? amen. All right, well, let's read on verse number 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. If he did not have access to the treasures of Egypt, this comparison would not be in the scriptures. Can the church say amen? And so 
he made the decision to esteem the reproach of Christ. Christ was back there in that day. Christ was in the church in the wilderness. Christ was among the Israelites in that time. It is clear from the scriptures here. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Read on. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. That recompense of reward has to do with not the reward in this life, but the reward of the life to come. Because Egypt was offering reward in this life. But he had respect for the recompense of the reward of what Christ was offering in the life to come. And this is what we're supposed to be doing in our day. Willing to give up whatever we have to give up for that which God has promised us in the life to come. Can the church say amen? amen. You remember the old song they used to sing? A poem they used to quote? A tent and a cottage. Why should I care? He's building a mansion for me over there. Come on, old timers. Wake up in here. Can the church say amen? amen. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on here and deal with ordination. Let's go to the uh, 13th chapter of the book of Acts. I have to get to this one. Your pastor will have to listen to the tape because this is important now that he, you all have elected him here. God has put that in your heart for him, you to do. Uh, he should be going according to Acts 13 for ordination. So you need to understand that ordination is not just some fly-by-night ceremony. When a person is ordained, it should be clear that there is a transformation that takes place as a transfer from God through those who ordain that individual in authority um, takes place. And they receive increased grace, if you will. And when I say increased grace, it doesn't mean that there's any grace stored up for a rainy day. It simply means that whatever grace that person needs to carry out the duties of that office and the responsibilities of the same and work under the influence of the Holy Spirit to uh, carry out the authority, God affords that person that grace. Amen. This is how it was with me when I was ordained elder as a pastor in Greater Bible and Temple in Jackson. And I received a, the level of grace as an elder. Then 10 years after that, I was uh, ordained uh, um, district elder. I served as a district elder, should I say, uh, for 10 years. And then I received grace to work as a district elder, to oversee the district. Then I Serve, uh, I was ordained Suffolk Bishop and was given, ordained as a Suffolk Bishop, given grace by God under Bishop Herman, a Suffolk Bishop, and was given grace by God for 10 years to operate as a Suffolk Bishop. So it was 10, 10, 10. 10 as an elder, 10 as a district elder, 10 as a Suffolk Bishop. That's exactly what it was. It was precisely 10 years I served in each of those offices before I was elevated again. And now, I've been elevated now to the office of bishop. I'm going into my fifth year of the office of bishop and 35th year of pastoring, uh, finishing up my 35th year of pastoring. So now it's five years in the office of bishop for a total of 35 years. Again, 10 as an elder, 10 as a district elder, 10 as a suffragan bishop, and now five as a full bishop. And so this is how it works. Now let's then go now to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, we want to read verses number one through five, uh, just for starters, to show you how God does it. Now, this is after the Apostle Paul um, has been uh, working, praise the Lord. He has been working uh, in the ministry for a number of years, um, and, but he has not as of yet, even though he's been called to the, uh, the apostleship, even though at this time he has come out of the desert of Arabia for the three and a half years and God has given him revelation at this time and uh, if I may be correct Barnabas has taken him and given him the right hand of fellowship with the other apostles but he at this time is coming to Antioch Antioch was the headquarters where they met on a regular basis and I'm trying to expedite as quickly as I can so I can get you out of here right at nine o'clock it's just not going to happen for me to be able to complete everything well at least I can get you started so now um, the Apostle Paul 
and Barnabas and others have come to Antioch. And they've come there for a council or uh, to conference. Because this is where, after each of Paul's missionary journeys, he, he launched on his missionary journey, then he returned to Antioch. Then he launched again, and he returned to Antioch. Well, at this time, they are in Antioch, he and Barnabas. And uh, this is where he is going to be ordained a full bishop in these verses that we're going to read here. Given the right hand of fellowship now by the other apostles, and now he's getting ready to be ordained a full bishop. So in the 13th chapter, verses number 1 through 4, let's be, 1 through 5, let's begin reading. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And that Saul, of course, some said was um, his name among the Hebrews, and Paul was his name among the Gentiles. So Saul is a Hebrew name. Read on. Verse number two. As he ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now, again, I want you to notice what you read here. They are fasting. They are praying. The Holy Ghost has spoken. But the Holy Ghost spoke to the leadership and gave the leadership instruction to do what? To separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. When they have fasted and prayed, what do they do? They lay their hands. This is ordination. They ordained them and did what? Sent them away. So how does the Holy Ghost send a person in ministry? The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit sends men and women by the hands of other men. It works through men. And this is what we're showing you. A person just, uh, Paul and them just didn't get up and say, God spoke to me and told me this. God spoke to me and told me that, which is what they do today. This is where they were gathering together, consecrating, fasting, and praying. And the Lord spoke to those in authority and leadership. Even the Apostle Paul, who is the author of two-thirds of the New Testament, the greatest man in the New Testament, given the apostleship to the Gentiles. The church, the church today is almost entirely a Gentile church. That means he would be our apostle. That means that outside of Jesus Christ, he is the greatest man in the life of all of individuals who are in the apostolic church today, apart from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Even he submitted himself to the authority of those who had the authority to ordain him. They laid their hands on them and sent them away. This is is how Jesus did his apostles. Jesus became a man, submitted himself to water baptism by a man, so no one would have an excuse to think that they could bypass men that he had ordained to get the job done. So there's no way around this. We have to hear a man or woman of God. Come to church, say amen. amen. All right, verse number four. Turn to someone and say, what happened? Read. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed on Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cy Cyprus, read, and when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. This is John Mark. This is the nephew of Barnabas, if you remember the history surrounding John Mark. Notice what they did when they were ordained. They didn't get ordained and go start a reality program. Can the church say hallelujah? <laughs> but unfortunately, that's what some people are doing today. They are confused. Turn to someone and say they're confused. And confused they are. All right. Uh, let's jump down and read now. Uh, let's read on down to verse number 15. We can at least get that in. We might be able to make it. Read on. Verse number 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos... They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now notice the order. 
Barnabas and Saul were separated in that order. It was Barnabas first and Saul. They're coming out of being ordained. It's Barnabas and Saul. When they reach this particular city uh, or island on, on Paphos, they run into this false prophet. The deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, is calling for Barnabas first and Saul second, desiring to hear the word of God. Now let's see how God works. Read on. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, which stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, everyone reading, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now notice verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos. It has gone from Barnabas and Saul to now Saul has emerged as the leader and it is now Paul and his company. And his company, which Barnabas is a part of because though they emerged from there when they were ordained, Barnabas and Saul, God had ordained that Saul be given the apostleship to the Gentiles. So eventually he had to emerge, and here's the scripture showing where he emerged from Barnabas and Saul to Paul and his company. And in Paul's company was Barnabas and Silas and Timotheus and Titus and Gaius and Aristarchus and Priscilla and Aquila and Phoebe and Apollos, just to mention 10 of his company. So we're simply showing you how God works. It may begin one way, but God can shift it all the way in another direction. But you have to be ordained to move up in God. You have to be in order to move up. How did Bishop Combs get where he got? He did what Bishop Paddock, Bishop Herman, and what Bishop Brisbane and everybody else told him to do. He did what he was instructed to do. And it didn't make any difference what people tried to do. Because he was in order, Bishop Combs was elevated. And that's how it works. Can the church say hallelujah? hallelujah? Verse 13, now when Paul and his company loose from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Now that's enough for tonight. Uh, I'm getting off a little early. I was going to deal with some more ordination. But I will have you read St. John chapter 15. Jesus said, I... Have, uh, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have ordained you. Jesus is the one that ordained his apostles. Paul had to be ordained because by the others because he was one born out of due season. And so because he was not there with the other apostles, his ordination had to take place later. You just saw it. It's in the scriptures. But he emerged as the leader. And as you read throughout the scriptures, you will see clearly that he emerged as the leader. Why am I teaching this tonight? So that you can understand. As long as you are in order, as happened to Bishop Brisbane, he was in order. And he moved up the ranks and became the presiding bishop of the Pentecostal of the world, holding the highest office that can possibly be held in the oldest Pentecostal organization in the world. That's not my subject to teach that tonight. I teach the history of this organization all over this country. Have taught it at the National Convention. Bishop Wagner, uh, one of his ministers heard me teach it at Bishop Tyson's several years ago when Bishop Tyson was allowed, alive excuse me, at the Regional Brotherhood Conference. So it was A. Glenn Brady, long before he became bishop, he went back and told Bishop Wagner that I had taught the history. Bishop Wagner heard the tape. 
he asked me to teach it at the National Convention. Interesting enough, I came in. Uh, he sat on the front row while I taught a two-hour Bible class on the history of the PAW. Now, Bishop Wagner's motive, um, he wanted me to get him in contact with President Bush because I was working for President Bush. And I didn't mind doing that, uh, but my point to Bishop Wagner was that is not important. Uh, I am a part of the, um, shall I say, internal circle of President Bush. So there's nothing um, special about that. The specialty is being a part of the internal circle of Jesus Christ. Can we say amen? amen. That's what you want to be uh, the part of. And just because I was at the White House all the time, he wanted to go. And, of course, I had no problem inviting him. Uh, and we flew back and forth a couple of times, and he wanted me to get him in with Bush's inner circle. But I tried to explain to Mr. Wagner, I said, I work for President Bush. I'm not window dressing for him. I'm doing a job for him. I have an assignment. And, of course, uh, much of that assignment has led to some very profitable things that happened for our church, which I don't have time to go into that, but the church did receive a $1 million donation because of, yes, it did, because of a gentleman that I was very close, that I became very close to, that was close to one of the doctors in my church, whom he wanted a meeting with President Bush. So I got him a meeting with President Bush and with Mike Levitt, HHS. He was able to get his health care organization, a pilot program with CMS, and he was so happy, he just started writing checks to our church um, for $8,000 a month, and he's been writing those checks since 2004. You do the math. I never asked him, and he did offer to do a number of things. I told him, I'm not, I don't charge any money for what I do. You do what you want to do. He made the decision. He wrote those checks. And this is what God did. And this is how God does it. If you are in order, trust me, everything that is to come to you will come to you if you are in order and if you stay in order. But if you don't come to Bible class, you won't be obedient. You won't follow the scriptures. You know what the fathers taught is true. You know this is probably the greatest church in Michigan in the apostolic movement. It's the oldest one in, 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 the, in the organization in this state. It has the, the greatest history and heritage of any of our churches almost in this country. You've had Bishop Haywood here, uh, Bishop Par, I mean, uh, uh, Reverend Parham here, District of Tobin here. Uh, it's up to you to uphold the legacy that God has given you. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Amen. I just came down here to encourage you, but it's up to you to uphold this legacy. It's up to you to invest in the per perpetuity of what God has done here. Now, um, the church in Jackson, I'm trying to set it up so that it has an endowment. If I die, it has some money, so it continues. I hope somebody comes there if something happens to me and keeps that going to the glory of God. Especially in looking at this church, which is 100 years old, plus and doing so well on the selecting a new pastor. But it's up to you to take serious what God has given you. Amen. Those sinners, sir, take their f uh, wicked stuff serious. Those sinners invest all kind of money in that foolishness out there. And I can show you that in the Bible because they think that their name, the Bible says, they think their name is going to continue. So the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. And the, the individuals who are members of the Bilderbergers and all of these great Jewish names, they invest hundreds and millions and billions of dollars in their legacy. So I would urge you to uh, get together and make sure you're working with uh, Suffolk Bishop Julian and your pastor and look at not only the short term of the church, but the long term of the church. Because you're too late in the game to start giving up now. Can we say Amen. The rapture is right around the corner, and even if the rapture isn't around the corner, your death is right around the corner. Praise the Lord. You might as well just own up to it. You're not going to live that, uh, here forever either. Can we say amen? So what we should be doing is giving diligence to make our calling an hour. Any questions tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I'll answer it if I can.